Welcome back, everyone, to uh, our meeting. We hope you were able to uh, get a little bit of a break, refresh yourself. There's some refreshments outside, so thankful for everyone who helped to pull that together. Uh, we're going to enter uh, back into uh, our time of public comment, uh, creating space, as we said earlier, for folks to both be reacting to what you've heard in the first half of our day and equally uh, other uh, either you know comments, uh, ideas, notions that you as a public would want us as the board to be considering with respect to uh, our discussion following public comment, um, certainly as we move towards the trajectory of getting this report out uh, by the beginning of the year. So we'll open it back up for public comment. We're going to ask you to keep your comments uh, brief to uh, about two minutes. Um, we'll ask people to line up behind uh, our relative who's, who's currently behind the mic. If you do have a comment, and, uh, and we're going to ask everyone to participate in standing in a line as much as possible so as to uh, decrease any uh, notions of confusion. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name's Lois Corrin. I live in the city of Piedmont, which is a non-diverse place surrounded by Oakland. I'm also a member of our diversity committee and we work on inclusion and diversity appreciation there. I'm delighted you had the meeting here in West Elkin. Nancy, thank you for inviting me. Um, Judge, I appreciate you giving context to the race relations in this country. And I'm glad to see so many black women in the house because we have, we are the mothers and daughters and sisters that deal with this problem when there's interaction with our young men. I'm also a special ed teacher in Oakland, and I'm hoping that the work you do will prevent my little young men from ever going down this path and being harmed. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joyce. I actually work upstairs at the West Oakland Job Resource Center helping people get employment um, in the community. I'm here to tell a little short story about something that happened to me December 20th, 2012. I was walking home from getting out for bar, had a bottle of water, and I happened to be on West MacArthur and Telegraph. And of course, I took the water bottle and I threw it down on the ground. Yes, I littered. I apologize for that. By the time I got to the Highway Patrol parking lot, two OPD cars pulled up and kind of stopped and I mean it was like really like wildly so I stepped back so I'm looking so I'm thinking they're just pulling in the parking lot going over there to hang out I don't know what they were doing it you know and when they jumped out the car four officers jumped out of the car now I'm looking because I think maybe I know these people and they're pulling a the joke I mean you know I know a lot of people in Oakland they one of the officers made an accusation that I was in a fight at a bar that was way past where I had, I had not been there once that was cleared and stuff, they arrested me for throwing the water bottle on the ground. I missed my flight the next day because I was in Santa Rita. And all of that being said, the one thing out of all of that, because I realize things happen and people make mistakes, you know what it did to me? I'm 50-some years old. It made me afraid of the police that I'm steady telling people that I work with are there to help them. It made a 50-something year old lady afraid. Until this day, I am still, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to interact. And being an Afro-American woman, you know, we, we don't never, you know, we're not sure. We're not sure you're coming at that. So I'm just saying that we need to, you know, maybe work on networking better. I'm not sure, but that was my experience that changed me for the rest of my life in my interactions. With the um, with law enforcement. Hi, I'm Reverend Jamita Davis Howard. I'm the assistant pastor at First Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church here in East Oakland in the Flatlands, as they call it. And I'm just here to continue to lift up the story of African American women. People tend to always think that this issue of racial profiling and um, identification is strictly to men of color, but they forget that there is a close knit circle and there is always ties and effects in the family and in in the community when racial profiling of black and brown men is done um, at a higher rate. Mothers are 
dignity and respect is taken away. Whenever you deal with the system and if you have a son who has been arrested or falsely accused and you're trying to advocate for them, the system takes away your dignity, reduces you to a color and a neighborhood rather than a person with intelligence, emotions, and sense. And just as Marilyn just told, um, Joyce just told her story, the, the um, inhuman, tr inhuman treatment of individuals because of their colors has to stop. I'm 50 something years old. I started my life in Hunters Point in San Francisco, and I remember the arrest of black men on a regular basis just because they looked like somebody who had done something all the time. And I'm just ashamed that our society is still dealing with this issue, especially the Bay Area in California 50 years later. We need to stop this. We need to treat people with dignity and respect and when you do that, you take away the elements of racial profiling and racial identification on a wholesale basis. So please, thank you for this committee, but this is a serious, serious matter, and I hope you guys take your task at hand. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My, name is, <laughs> my name is Sister Mary Amora. I'm on my way to uh, 80 in a few months, and uh, I belong to a Marist Missionary Sister Order, so I've had experience living for many years, mostly in the Pacific. I've been in uh, uh, the Fiji Islands and New Zealand, and then I've also been in Caribbean, uh, Jamaica, and the Virgin Islands. As a matter of fact, my family comes from Jamaica, and I, we are first born here. Uh, I just want to say a few lines because I've only been living in Oakland for about three years and I've been very much impressed with the work that's going on for trying to make Oakland a better place. I've been very much touched by the, the agony and the disturbance and the, the trauma of the peoples not just because some have been killed from their family, their loved ones, but also because it's their community and it has such an effect. Uh, the church that I attend is St. Columba, which it has a garden filled with white crosses that mark the numbers of people in Oakland who have been killed by gunfire. And uh, every year, at the end of the year, we have a time of coming together, all the community, we have leaders of the various faith communities, and uh, we, we have, uh, we've had uh, various um, justice and enforcement people, like, oh, okay. And uh, what, what I really want to say is, I think the whole of the United States has a, little, a real cockeyed way of putting terminology on people and where they're supposed to be in terms of how they look. I don't consider myself a fat African American. I'm Afro Caribbean American, but of course you look at me and you see my color, so you put me in that category. Well, the thing is that we we have people from different parts of the world here, and people are supposed to have certain colors so that we can profile them, and it really doesn't work because there are certain attitudes that people have when they're mistreated by armed forces that are disturbing and upsetting and we see a lot of revenge that we build up. So uh, I'd just like to put my two cents in. Thank you. Hello. Hi everyone. Um, so I am the one person that never stands up for their self. I'm the one person that is affected by the gentrifications in West Oakland. I am from Dogtown area, which is located on 30th and Union, 32nd and Atline. Pobler Park is a big landmark for us. I'm one of the ones that's so affected by 
the racial profile and the non-economic development for black low income mothers with children who are single that have kids out of wedlock. I'm one of that 1%. And I'm standing up because it's no one doing anything about the issue. Our numbers will not be going up. Our homeless will not be going up. I've been in the rat race for six years now. I own an organization. I give eight events a year by myself. I am not a 501C. I am in the community where I help destroy. I have a lot of felonies. I have not been convicted in 11 years. And I've gave everything sentimental value that I can to my community. And everyone there now, the rich developers, the other society that has moved in, it's not making it easy for me. So my point is that I don't only want to come to these meetings and talk about it. I want the board to implement things that I can come in here and say, y'all system worked for me because it's not working for us out there. And it's to the point where you guys are affecting great people like myself who has degrees, who gave my time to the system. And after I earned the right, it's not there anymore to participate in a beautiful environment, a nice walk my children to a nice park. So I would like people to really step up and help us out there. Those that really matter are the people who are getting neglected, not treated with humane. I've been stopped on 30th and Union by Oakland police in that area. Me and my children, I have five kids, over on record 40 times. Allegedly for drugs and never got busted with drugs, do not have a drug case, and they've never donated toys. So please, OPD, I need toys this year. So yeah, have a great day. Good afternoon. <clears throat> well, I've, well, I've been, um, me and a friend, uh, one day going, coming from school, college, um, when we were coming home from school, being uh, stopped by the pol police for mistaken identity, looking like someone uh, uh, beating up beating up a, a kid uh, in my neighborhood that stayed right around the corner from me, and they stopped us, taking us downtown. Uh, uh, then turn around, our parents get called. Parents worried, like like many other parents, single parents. They run down downtown town. I had a, a an uncle that was a lieutenant under Oakland police. So happened that he uh, asked one of the officers to hold up. Let 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 me uh, talk to him. That's all I have to say. Good afternoon, my name is Justin Pierre. I hail from the most corrupt state in the yet to be United States of America, Florida. Don't debate me, I'll fight you later. But um, I've been here for a year now and uh, I must confess, I am a repeat offender, um, DWB, driving while black. Um, I've been pulled over just because I'm black. Um, I don't have a criminal record, I went to school, have a master's degree. Um, but unfortunately, my uh, skin color has been uh, criminalized. And um, the judge alluded to earlier that uh, we need to remember the history, the historical context. Let us not forget that race is a man-made construct. Once you can label somebody, you can limit them. And so as we revision and strategize on how we can make our communities safer, how to build trust, I want to challenge you all to not forget that the system isn't just broken, the system is working as designed. And so as you strategize, as you revision, as you try to um, make adjustments and make things better, never forget the historical context um, of, of policing, um, slave catchers, you know, that was their job. Where are your freedom papers? Um, and so re-educating the different 
levels, whether it's schools, police forces, we need to talk about that history and keep it at the forefront as we reimagine on how to um, dismantle this corrupt system that's working and to put compassion where that corruption is. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tara Stewart. And like, my, I'm an organizer with Inland Congregation United for Change. And for us to get to this point where I'm at today, we, um, we have done a lot of community work around policing as far as like, we have done, um, talked to over 100 people about the issues. We have canvassed in the community. We have had listening sessions. We have met with the police chief, the lieutenants, and everybody. We have talked to different people within the community, churches, um, NAACP, and every kind of other organization. And like a lot of our concerns comes from not just the way I feel as a person that has been racially profiled, but also how the community feels. And like, what happens in Riverside is that they have something like AB 953 or the Racial Identity Profiling Act when, when, after Taisha Miller got killed. And like, the, the, my, my main concern is, is that like they did the data, but then the police chief said that nobody did no, no reports or nothing to make a change. So like, one of my things is about is like, if we're doing this to make, to create this data and stuff that we put together something so that we can make a change, because like everybody knows, and if you don't know, um, it was a grant that, that made them prioritize drug crimes over murders and everything else. And then because of that, they had to fulfill these grants. And because of that, they had to get people bodies and the bodies that they had targeted for, for a long time is people that look like me. And it's like, if this point in history, if we know that this is a fact, then we need to fix this because like we're not the only person on drugs we're not the only people doing this stuff but my population is being targeted and then the last thing i see i got the last minute but is um but the racial profile stops that's one part but it's also like after you being stopped it's like are they searching your stuff and like that's another component of it because you can stop a person at an equal rate but if you're not searching them and looking through their car for all types of other things, then they just, you're just stopping them. And then if you're charging to other people and you're going through their stuff, then they're being locked up. And then there's over 4,800 collateral consequences of criminal conviction. So now, as a criminal conviction, I cannot um, live in housing. I cannot um, get a job. I cannot, you, I, you know, there you go, I can't get funding. I, can't, I, get, I get stopped from college grants. I get all this stuff. All I want to be in life is to live. And all I want to do is provide for my family. And I would like for y'all to stop harassing me, for y'all to stop putting these barriers for me to re-entry, for my kids to grow up in this world as successful human beings. You know, and if we have an opportunity right now to make that difference, we should take this very serious and stand on the right side of history. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jabari Holder. I'm here representing Heat. I would like to say, I, like, I would like to piggyback off what my brother just said, slave catching, where's your papers? That sounds the same thing to me as when they stopped me and asked me, am I on probation or parole? Which I'm not, but that sounded like the same thing. I wanted to just bring that up. The main fact that I wanted to bring up is I keep hearing a lot of data and a lot of paperwork and a lot of this needs to happen over time and a, a bunch of bullshit, excuse my language, a bunch of bullshit. Do your own data. Do your own homework. Do your own background. Take them suits, take them ties, take them badges. Leave that at home for a month and be, put some regular shoes on and some regular clothes and see how your fellow officers treat you while you're in these communities. See how they treat you on a regular day basis when your license plate don't have a special code, when your ID don't read a special thing. Like take that suit and that tie off and be me for a month and see how you get treated. Probation or parole, I'm not. I work for my community. I take care of my community. I'm trying to build my community. Y'all making it hard. Y'all making it hard when I tell my brothers and my sisters in my community that the police are all right because I have been working with Deputy Armstrong. The police are all right. They, 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 they trying to make things better, but then they look on social media and one of y'all other officers who was not in this room or who was not a part of this conversation 
it's being a hell to what y'all are talking about. I could sit down and somebody could sit down with some officers and you could vouch for the police department, but that rookie officer is still doing the same thing that we sitting here complaining about. You can't speak for him. And I think some accountability needs to be held for that. All that paperwork, all them statistics, we're talking about real life. We talk about real life. I'm going to the grocery store to get my daughter some milk, and y'all telling me y'all just got a call because I'm in a known drug neighborhood, and you just got a call, and I fit the description. You fit the description of the officer that I just seen on social media that just did something wrong to somebody. So I'm scared the same way you scared. You ain't got no fear, and if you and I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna be done with it. An officer of the law is supposed to obey the law. Don't sign up if you're scared. The same people that y'all say criminals, thieves, and murderers is the same people who I got to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't get no protection. I don't get no vest. I don't get no, 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 no accessories around my waist. I get none of that. I got to survive around these people. Stop with the excuses. Hi. Um, my name is Tony McNeil. I am an elder. Um, from Victory and Praise Church, and I live in Stockton, California. Um, I work in Live Free, I work in Heat um, in Stockton, California. I'm also an organizer with Faith in the Valley. Um, and I was not going to say anything, and I was um, profiling some of you that profile us while they were speaking, and thought I better go ahead and get up and say something. I spend the majority of the time throughout my day going in and out from environments, adjusting myself. I adjust my posture. I adjust my body language. I adjust my speech. I am intentionally speaking in the dialogue and with the vocal inflections, with the soft tone and mannerism, looking at you in the way that I am. Even some of you that are avoiding eye contact because my very presence and authority that I innately have makes you uncomfortable. And I sat in that seat and I looked at some of you. I looked at you. I looked at your posture and in your stature. I looked at the badge that you have on the side of your waist. I looked at your hair and the fact that it's shaved bald. And I profiled you. I didn't get a chance to look at your eyes to see whether or not I could trust you. I didn't get a chance to see whether you were a genuine individual that would hurt or harm me. I had to just assess you quickly, the way that I get assessed quickly. The way that most of the time when we get stopped, I see it, get assessed very quickly. What we're asking, those of you that have the authority that has been granted you to do, is to take into consideration how offensive these beautiful women sitting here have would be if I said you're racist. Just because you're white, just because of the way that you look, just because of the way that you dressed, just because you're racist. You hate me, you are a threat, and I need to now engage you in an agitational manner in order to prevent you from inflicting pain on me. How offensive would that be for you to have to be called a racist? You're a bigot, and I know that you hate me, and I know it is offensive. However, we deal with it every day every day and there's nothing we can do about it got you there's nothing that we can do about it so now i'm standing here clearly understanding that you all have the power that white supremacy has granted you to make the adjustments that we need to stop having to adjust daily Hi, um, my name is Tia Ronsaville, and I'm representing the Oakland Peace Center. Um, I've only been in California for a month, um, but I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and a lot of things that have been happening um, in St. Louis have been 
poignant in my mind. Um, one of my friends were peacefully protesting and she got a baton stuck up to her throat. Um, and she had to stand her ground when police officers were saying back to protesters, they were chanting, whose streets? Our streets. Literally saying that it's, it's not even a community, it's, it's a us versus them kind of mentality and that's not how it's supposed to be. Um, why should my people, why should people of color, why should anyone be automatically criminalized just because they're trying to use their voice and stand up for their communities? Like I live three minutes from Ferguson in St. Louis and I'm constantly reminded whenever I go back home that I'm not actively using my voice out of fear and I have a six-year-old daughter so it's either I have to decide whether I want to engage with activism and engage with being a voice for my people or just living in fear of possibly dying at the hands of people who are supposed to protect me. Um, and like I said, I just moved to California. Um, I have three white roommates, and I am the only black female in our house. We live in Alameda. The first night we went out, a police officer, and I was wearing my hat just like this, because I like wearing my hat this way. Um, but a police officer slowed down, and just I could feel his stares. I literally could feel the presence of a person in a car staring me down, believing that I look suspicious. Every day I pass this, this sign that has like this amb ambiguous picture of this person in a hat, and it's like, if we report the suspicious activity in our neighborhood, and I'm like, this, this ambiguous sign of a person could be me. This random caricature of, <laughs> Obviously, uh, a person in a hoodie and a hat is automatically suspicious because that's how society has, well, that's how white supremacy has cultivated our minds to even internalize that. Anti-blackness is a form of white supremacy. <laughs> so it's just, policing shouldn't be that way. People shouldn't have to fear walking down the street and I shouldn't have to fear whether using my voice is either going to get me killed or it's going to take me home to see my daughter at night. So, thank you. Good afternoon everybody. My name is Greg Jones and I'm a community organizer with Inland Congregations United for Change, a part of Pico Network, a part of the Heat Campaign and one thing I want to know is like you in you all in authority like what do you guys want from people of color like what do you want from us you know like when you see us what is it that you hope to gain from us like do you want to treat us as if we don't exist like we could only be in this section of the world and you guys can be up here so that you guys can feel safe and feel like everyone that looks like you thinks like you behaves like you eats what you eat and deserve to be thought of as the best in the world do you want us to believe in a system that's a lie, to raise our kids on the same lies that we were raised on, to grow up, to have to take them to church every week, and to let, let, let them sit there and listen to a sermon based on a lie that was predicated to oppress the people, to strip them of their religion, of their name, of their dignity, of their humanity. I mean, what do you guys want from us? You know, we go to work, we pay our taxes, send our kids to school. Yet, you don't want us all to have jobs. You know what I'm saying? So then we go commit crimes in order to survive. You know, do you want us to not eat? Do you want us to starve to death and lay in the street dying? You know, do you want our, our bodies to be melting on the, on the, um, on the sidewalk like, um, like Michael, um, like Mike Brown? You know, do you want us to live in inferior communities where 
You guys don't invest back in the communities where you don't offer the people loans so that they can have better houses, so that they can invest in a business or a second career. Yet you want us to put our, put our name on the line, put our social security on the line, put our credit on the line, and not support that like you support other, others in other communities? Like what do you want from us as minorities? I just really want to know like, I mean you provide all of these things, they turn out to be facades. I call them little white lies because there's really no truth to any of it. Like, if you all live in a community and someone like me moves in your community, you get together and tell everyone in your community that your property value has gone down because these people of color live there now. When the truth is, the property value is going to go up because y'all don't want no more people of color in that community. So really, like, what do y'all want from us? You know, I would like to know so that moving forward, when I come to these kind of events, these kind of activities of gathering of people in authority and people who have control or, or authority over those in authority so that I could really know what I'm here for. You know, if I know that you guys just want us here so that we could kind of feed this lie that we keep telling our kids, then say it. Just so that we could keep on saying this lie, we keep on believing the lie, and we can go on about our day and we don't have to build up our, our, our blood pressure and risk our health and have to be submissive to another system of health care which is going to kill us any, even quicker. So again, I want to ask you, and I really want y'all to think about it, what do y'all want from us? Thank you. Thank you to the public for uh, your comments. I don't believe there, there are any more, uh, there's any more public uh, comments, so I think we will Sorry guys, I should have stayed in line. But I just wanted to kind of address just one thing. So if anyone in this room right now is having a reaction where internally you're like, I am not racist. Internally, you're, you're literally screaming out right now, I am not racist. I just want to point out that we all have implicit, um, some of us have explicit biases. And so you've heard a few folks get up and list um, or name for you heat. And you might be sitting here thinking, what is heat? It's, it's a program that seeks to identify and um, build trust, trust between law enforcement and trust through fractured communities. So if the North Star is trust and you have community members saying um, that, that we want to partner with law enforcement, part of the way we can do that is lifting up existing solutions that have already been done. So POST does have procedural justice training, and part of the HEAT project's goal is to get procedural justice training into the, the law enforcement agencies throughout the state of California. So you've heard from community members who represent about um, maybe a couple of the 14 cities that we're, that we're doing the HEAT project in currently. And so I invite you guys and I challenge you to think we don't always have to reinvent the wheel. So while our, our, our next steps will be to, to do the data collection and move towards kind of implementing some new things, we should also revisit what's already being done. So if you want to know what community wants in terms of building trust, we want to partner in, in helping to bring about training that's, that's been vetted. You know, Stanford's done this, the DOJ has done this, and so it's things that the community is saying we believe in, and so part of, part of the way that we can help to address the issue of racial profiling is really getting the, the procedural justice, the principled policing courses in the agencies throughout the state. All right, I'm gonna try this again. So now I believe that we are at the end of public comment. Um, and so now we will, we just wanna say again to the public, thank you for your, your comments and your stories and bringing that into our space, um, a shared space for all of us as community. So I think now we, we will return the conversation back to the board uh, to have some um, conversation uh, about uh, subcommittee reports and other issues that uh, folks want to be raised. I know there were people that had uh, some points. Maybe I'll start with uh, uh, Co-Chair Medrano, who I know had a, a couple things that he wanted to note, and then we'll open it up for the rest of the board. Thank you. Um, I'll first start off with the, the issue of training. Um, uh, Judge Lotto brought up a, a, a number of issues uh, with respect to her evaluation of the post-training. And as a procedural justice instructor, I understand uh, her perspective uh, relative to training. And I just want to, I don't know if it's caution, but I just want to you know, have us all think about that. There is not going to be one course that's going to have officers 
att you know, attend this course and everything is going to change. Um, you know, if we are going to get into the, the deep-rooted causes of what's going on, this is going to be a sustained effort. Um, and we have, to, we have to think about that as we approach this as uh, a rip aboard about not just thinking about, okay, we've identified this training and, and checked that box out. Uh, this is about how we identify sustainable long-term training efforts throughout a law enforcement officer's career. Um, and that's going to take significant investment. And, you know, um, in California, we place a lot of emphasis on post. Uh, and quite frankly, I don't think post, based on its current ab ability, can do that for us if things don't change. Um, so as we, as we move forward to looking at training, we really need to support those efforts and the organizations that are going to make that training a reality. We had a discussion at one of the prior board meetings about making a recommendation to the, to the post commission about having someone on this board be part of the post commission. I think that's something that continue, we need to continue to follow up with. I think it's uh, based on, on, on the requirements of this board, I think that would be an ideal asset to add to the post uh, commission so that as we identify needs, we can advocate those needs to the commission and our legislators. Um, the next thing I, I wanted to move and talk a little bit about is the discussion about the, the 2018 report. Um, this report is, is going to be due quicker than, than we can imagine. And we've talked a lot about different things in, in uh, several of the uh, subcommittee reports. And, and the, the real question comes is, what are we going to do with a report that doesn't contain data? I mean, that's essentially it. Uh, you know, we, we, we have this effort. Uh, moving forward that we're going to collect it and we're going to get to a point where we're going to be able to establish a report that's based on analyzed data uh, that's contextualized and it can be useful for us. But what do we do until then? And um, one of the discussions that I think came out of the evidence-based uh, research committee was <coughs> we need to start having an understanding of like terms, <coughs> framing our discussion relative to what, what, what are we trying to address? What, in terms of what are the differences between the disparities, the profiling, biases, stereotyping? Do we all have the same like terms? Do, are we going to be issuing a report? If no one understands exactly how we're defining our terms, I think it's going to be difficult for under, understand. You know, we can start beginning laying the found, found foundation for what other studies have shown, how they use the information, how that information can be used moving forward re relative to when we start collecting uh, data in the future. We can start talking about the things that we want to do with the data once we have it. Um, uh, Professor Everhart mentioned uh, seven deliverables. I think that needs to be discussed in our report about these are the, some of the, the deliverables that we are going to do with the data. And, and then lastly, um, you know, well, it's two last, two things, sorry. Then we also need to talk about um, what's working. I mean, we meant, a couple of people mentioned like what's working. There's, we can give some, uh, you know, indications of things that we know throughout the state, as mentioned by one of the speakers, that is working. That maybe we want to continue to support and highlight. And I know that's also one of the delivers. And finally, and I think a very powerful message is what are we doing as board members? You know, this is a very diverse board. And I think collectively, we, we, we have the power to have a unified voice. We don't all agree on this board, but I will tell you this. I have been absolutely surprised at the level of engagement and, um, and, part, and you know, understanding that the members of this board have shown, not only collectively in this meeting, but at our subcommittee meetings. We need to also demonstrate that this board is not about sitting and having these meetings and publishing a report and not, not changing anything. I think everyone on this board is committed. And one of the things we should do as part of the first report is have some stories or maybe a video or something of all of us together saying, look, uh, we all, I'm sure, have busy lives, but we are committed to doing this and to demonstrate that this board uh, wants to take action. It's not about publishing a report, making recommendations that never change anything. Opening it up for board discussion comments, either about earlier things uh, or, or things, you know, certainly the subcommittee reports, uh, or certainly as we're thinking about uh, notions of how we want to inform the end of the year report. 
Yeah, one of the things I was thinking about as hearing the discussion is in terms of officer accountability and how that goes into the post training. I'm not certainly an expert in the post training, but I think it's important for folks who have been victimized by police misconduct to know that that there should be something in the officer's training that lets them know that they need to police themselves, that if they know of a fellow officer who is not acting appropriately, that they have a obligation and a duty to, um, to hold that officer accountable, just like they ask citizens to, if they know of a suspect who's committed a crime, you know, don't, don't say, well, you can't snitch, you know. We, we don't want that same attitude with police officers. If they know that a police officer is acting inappropriately, they should say, this is my obligation as a police officer to hold that person accountable, either anonymously or whatever, because as we know, most officers do a great job and they want to do good. And they're, as in any profession, I'm a lawyer, they're bad lawyers. You know, uh, in police, there's going to be some bad police. But if you don't root out the bad ones, then they, you know, it's like that bad apple spoils the barrel. So I think it should be part of the police officer's training to say, look, as we enforce the law, as we expect citizens to enforce, the, uh, be mindful of the law, we have to be mindful of police misconduct. And to the extent that we know about it, that they should uh, say, this is my obligation to, to root it out. A report possibly at the very beginning has got to devote, if this is possible, um, a reasonably sh uh, short paragraph on the, the history and the role of the police officer in a Western society. Hmm. My guess is most people don't know. I mean, they really don't know anything about what police are supposed to do beyond TV, movies, and what you read in the newspaper. Uh, I think. Anything we say thereafter will be colored by a, a clear, lucid, and um, fair description of the history and role of the police officer. I, I want to second that in, in the sense that even some of the training that I've done with law enforcement agencies has been quite clear, not just in the general public, but, but certainly in policing, uh, not a deep understanding of the history and the impact of policing on communities of color, uh, particularly with younger uh, officers that were, were coming in. Um, there's they're simply not, not a, a knowledge of the history there. Are many of, one, of, of, of officers that I talked to uh, individually expressed that their understanding of the fragmentation between law enforcement and communities of color started with Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement. So they were like saying, well, we know this, there were problems like in the 60s, but we fixed all of that, yeah. you know? And, and so it was, I was glad that they were sharing that, but I was also deeply concerned with a revisionist history or, or only a 50 year old memory and not really being able to hold that, you know, many of us people of color have grandparents whose parents were slaves, right? And, and you know, our, our, our parents picked cotton you know, in, in the South and, and so, and had to deal with policing. So um, I, I just want to second that notion that I think as we build the report, we need to do so in such a way that, that, that in a very courageous way tells the story of what has happened. That, that does not have to be a sense of, and, and I hope folks can, can understand that, that telling the truth about history is not uh, political, it's just responsible. Right, that we got to tell the story about what's happened and particularly who it happened to and, and subsequently how that, that potentially can, or at least how that's created the construct for where it is that we, we are now. So I'm, I'm hoping that you know, as, as we carry that with the DLJ, we can really think about doing some really important history as, as a part that frames why we need the ripper board, why we need the, the data.
Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Reverend McBride and Chief Madrona and the others, Judge Lytle, for your comments. Yeah, I, I just want to echo how important this first report can be, even though we don't have data, right? It can be the foundation. It could be the context. It can be the launching point. It could be the acknowledgement of all we've been hearing from the community about the urgency of now. And I think uh, because we don't have data, maybe that is our opportunity to take a little bit more time to tell the story of how we got to this place and what's at stake. And so that coupled with the, um, you know, the, the baseline information that we hope to gather from the surveys, I think could put us in, in a good position to then receive the data and show that we are listening, we are responsive, and we're ready to move forward. And data is just one, one component of what we're going to be doing. One of the uh, things that was mentioned earlier today gave me concern as a peace officer in California. There was a young woman who uh, spoke during the public comment early on this afternoon. And what resonated with me, and I'm sure did with the other three law enforcement representatives and others in the audience, is uh, mm -hmm. it has changed her life for the rest of her life. And uh, that gives me great concern that we probably have lost someone who could work within the community to assist us. And uh, I, I would implore this board to uh, work with our legislators, work with our various groups in here. Uh, last year, uh, we had a bill, PORAC had a bill that we were sponsoring that uh, opened up much more transparency. And the bill's not dead, but it's a two-year bill now. Inside of that bill was one of the components that came out of Los Angeles. And I surely cannot speak for the city of Los Angeles or their association, LAPPL, but they did. And they brought to us that was originally included in this language a moderation port where the community member could sit down across the table from a law enforcement person to work out the differences of a stop, of a complaint, of anything like that. And it has been overwhelmingly received from what we can gather in Los Angeles between the communities and the law enforcement. So perhaps we can all work collectively together on this board and with our advocates to bring legislation like this forward to bring those bonds together within the communities. The mediation part that I've heard that does happen in Los Angeles has been a tremendous success. Uh, and there are other components of that bill that would build relationships within our community. We collectively, uh, one of the other speakers mentioned, uh, you know, what, what, can, what can we do? Well, let's work collectively together on this. Thank you. Thank you. Let me also commend uh, all who sit on this board and certainly all those who bring comments from the community. Y your comments have been um, deeply felt today on my part and I'm certain on the parts of other members of this great board. Um, we here in California live in a state that represents the presence of three of the five largest law enforcement bodies in the country. So as law enforcement is looked at in the country, uh, it's mirrored in California. So we really have to be, take real careful care and specific uh, um, deliberate intent to do as much as we possibly can, as often as we possibly can, to correct some of the um, incorrect behavior that has taken place in the past on both sides, on perceptions on both sides. Um, what we are doing here is important. It is tremendously important. And we need to make certain that the public who views uh, the level of importance of, uh, of our involvement, our engagement, get a clear sense that we are doing this to uh, effect some real positive, lasting, uh, and all too often demanded change. 
and that's to change for all sides and for all people, for the masses in general. And I'm hoping that what our efforts will endure to will be uh, one that will help to uh, look at how uh, not only uh, training and post-training takes place, but also how recruitment takes place. And to understand, as I heard it said the other, uh, just earlier today, that uh, racism is, uh, is a human construct. Um, and uh, sometimes that is difficult to distinguish or differentiate uh, from uh, uh, the misconduct or the misbehavior uh, that comes from police officers and oftentimes viewed as being uh, racist or at least having racist undertones. So what we need to do is make certain that we um, interface with our legislators, that they can clearly see the intent of what we do here as a reflection from what we've been able to sense from the general public, not just from this setting today and from other settings we've had, but every time we hear about uh, or watch one of the episodes of police misconduct or police excessive force, especially those that end up uh, in death uh, on television or uh, see the marches and see the demonstrations that take place in the aftermath of one of those occurrences. Uh, it further uh, undermines the importance of what we do here and uh, we need to make certain that we insist uh, on every uh, applicable uh, use uh, and involvement of any tool or any, any equipment that can help us get to the bottom of it all and maybe looking at the way recruitment has taken place and uh, since um, racism is a human construct and the misbehavior uh, that comes uh, from uh, persons who misbehave in, uh, in their positions, perhaps we, we need to make sure that uh, the process engages um, not only uh, behavioral um, uh, um, persons, uh, behavioral um, uh, professionals, but also those who have psychological abilities uh, who helped us to identify early on and make certain that that um, element remains in place uh, throughout the career. Um, it, it's important for all of us, and I think it can certainly endure to all of our common good. So thank you, commendations to you uh, for the chair, the role of the chairs who have done such a great job, and committee persons who have worked extensively to help bring the data to the table. And we're just hopeful that this data will help get us so close to where we need to be. But more than anything else, the public realize this is a necessary process. Without this process, we probably cannot get to the greater uh, uh, fight that is ahead of us. So thank you very much to uh, the board as well as to those who watch us from afar as well as those who are here in this room. A couple more uh, comments I just wanted to put out in front of us as well as we think about the report. Um, I, I think it's important that it doesn't get lost on us when we think about the need to retell the the history of what's brought us to this moment, that we also ensure that in that telling of history, we build it beyond the racial, you know, uh, you know, stratum, if you will, um, but make sure that we also talk about identity uh, in that. We make sure that we tell the story of our LGBTQ relatives that have been impacted. We tell the story of the Stonewall, you know, uprising that happened, which was because of the you know, uh, extorting and harassment and abuse that were happening to our queer relatives in New York, and that being one of the big, you know, pieces, I think, making sure we tell the story of uh, uh, our religious minorities and, and the way in which both foreign and domestic, uh, a foreign and domestic understanding uh, of different people and the way in which xenophobia, systemic xenophobia has played a role in certain people groups, uh, you know, both in the way in which that's, you know, uh, you know, was evidence in our history around the, the Japanese internment camps, but then also the way in which we focus that on, on thinking about the way in which re many religious minorities feel at risk and have been at risk because of current policy uh, of this administration. I just think it's important that we as California lead in, in some of these conversations. And, and then the second note that um, I just wanted to put out uh, before the board as well is this sense of, you know, I, I want to caution us from feeling the need to, um, you know, sometimes I'll hear, hear the language kind of like, well, if we're going to put these reports out, we need to make sure that we talk about them from both sides. Um, I'm, that concerns me a lot. And I don't know that no one's directly said that here, but I, I think sometimes there is a false 
equivalency um, around the kind of both sides dynamic. Absolutely, we recognize that there are human beings on, on both sides of the conflict. But, you know, as I keep beating the drum, power, it doesn't exist on both sides of the conflict. And so I think the way in which we tell the stories of those who have less power in the relationship uh, is, is got to be incredibly important. I'm hoping that in our report, we can use some of the stories that have come from public comment uh, over our various meetings to put those in the report as a way for us to say, these are the narratives that we have captured for moving you know, open dialogue spaces across the state, and this is what, what we've heard. Um, I just think, you know, all of that will, will, will be important um, so we can hold up the narratives of black lives, of native lives, of brown lives. Uh, I don't subscribe that there are blue lives because we don't call UPS people brown lives. So, you know, your, 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 uh, that, was a that was a joke for all the, you know, <laughs> law enforcement folks in the room. But I'm serious at the same time, right? That, that your, your vocation is not who you are. So I just think it's important for us to make sure that, that we focus our report on addressing the context of particularly people of color that have been impacted as much as we can make it not just about the larger history of America, but talk about the history of California, talk about the segregated covenants in California, that the Bay Area had restrictive covenants on where people of color could live that were enforced by the police here in the Bay Area up to 50, 60 years ago. I think a very California-specific history would be helpful in, in, in making the, the, our narrative and our work much more focused. Judge, and then Chief. Uh, I'd like to uh, indicate uh, that I certainly agree on that because if we look at the, the legislation, um, essentially the um, point is made that uh, this board was created um, because racial profiling is prohibited and we're supposed to do something about it with respect to data collection, if nothing else. Uh, but the fact of the matter is um, we do have to indicate in our discussion of the role of the police in the history of policing uh, that um, there has not been just a perception of misconduct but the actuality and not so we can make the police look like the bad guys and we're the good guys that's not what it's about but if somebody says why are you here and we say well we're collecting data the next question is going to be why are you collecting data and I think that's got to be a part of the introduction to a report. So with respect to, the, with respect to, to putting this report together, and this is our report, um, so it, it's not um, us and telling DOJ this is our thoughts and uh, come back when you have a draft so we can review. Uh, I, I'm thinking procedurally how we can put some of the ideas together. I, I realize that we have these um, working groups uh, and the committees, but we, they're subject to meeting requirements that may make this, you know, facilitating the actual assistance in writing this report difficult. So I think there needs to be a discussion on how we look at our committees and maybe either combining some of them or coming up with, uh, a, 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 in the end, a final committee that can help with the report, because ultimately, uh, if we don't have a strategy moving forward, we're gonna be at our November meeting with a month to go and, and wondering uh, what's this report look like. So have we had this, I mean, what would it be the strategy moving forward to, to keep making that a reality? Uh, I this first report is particularly important and that in the absence of the data, kind of laying out the problem, the seriousness, I think we talked about how to integrate some of the really um, impactful public comment that we've heard, and, and I think part of that could go into the sections that you were just talking about, Reverend, um, and others in the solution and, and specific sections. But um, I just wanted a reminder on uh, what's the, is the, what is the maximum number of board members that are allowed to talk to each other? Because I wonder if, if two or three can, if some of the committee co-chairs uh, you know, could be feeding drafts then to the co-chairs kind of thing. Because I agree with you, the time constraints to actually do this by committee, this could be really difficult. So, uh, so Chief Madrano um, alluded to a November meeting. We, have, we haven't noticed a November meeting yet, but we are planning to 
to do that tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> it will be November 27th um, and in, held in Stockton. The idea is um, between now and that time to continue working in your subcommittee groups and to hopefully have some kind of a full draft to present to the full board at the November 27th meeting. A rough draft. It can be very rough. But it, we have to keep moving, right? Because um, we don't have much time. So the way um, you can work or continue to work with the two co-chairs, uh, working directly with Shannon and Randy and Kelsey and uh, Kevin. Kevin. And then, uh, now, if there is somebody on this, a subcommittee that wants to contribute something, they, they can provide that to Shannon, but because of the open meeting requirements, it's going to be hard for Shannon to really convey that back to the subcommittee unless there's a public meeting. But that can be discussed in one of the subcommittee meetings. So the plan is to have each of the subcommittees work on their piece with the co-chairs really kind of spearheading some, some ideas, drafting, that can go back and forth. Uh, between DOJ staff and the subcommittee chairs. And then that piece will be presented in the November meeting. After you all have a chance to really to look at that and discuss it at the November meeting, we are planning on having a video conference multi-city um, meeting on December 19th. My memory is pretty good. <laughs> and the reason we're doing it um, by by video conference in various cities is because we know it's right around the holidays, but the hope is that we take what you can, what you provide to us on the 27th and then get it back to you hopefully a week before that meeting so you can really, you know, vote on, you know, the concepts, the content, and that by, November, by December 19th we have a very near final product that will be posted um, on the website in, De in the end, either the end of December or the beginning of January. Can you just remind us what's the maximum number of members that talk to each other? Two. Two. But it can't, see, we, we're, we're limiting it really to co-chairs, need to, can only talk to co-chairs, because if you start splintering off, then it, you don't know who's talked to who, and then it becomes a, a serial meeting. It'll come on when you start talking. That sounds super fun. And, you know, I think we're up to the challenge. I think we need to figure out how we're going to do the contextual piece, the preamble that we've been talking about. And I'm wondering if that's something that our two co-chairs could, could tackle. Uh, that would be really helpful. But I think that I think it's a good plan given the constraints that we have. I'm um, up to the challenge. Are, are you, Commissioner? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, I just want to go back for a minute. Before we, we took a break, there was a, a recommendation about maybe combining the the subcommittees on citizen complaint and the racial profiling uh, training uh, uh, policies. That part of it. Are, are we still going to take a look at that? Is that something? Uh, well, I, 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 I made that yeah. suggestion, and that was because I just heard the committee reports, and they sounded very, very similar. And now, in light of the recent information and, and the, the more meetings that we're going to have to have, it, it may be uh, beneficial. But you know, that's obviously up to a, the board to vote on that. If we do, obviously, there's two co-chairs for each committee. They're going to have to select just one from each uh, to make that happen. But uh, I think it's something that's worth consideration. Um, I'll just add one other wrinkle to that, which is that we can't have more than eight board members on any one subcommittee. Because that would be more than a, a quorum. We, we would be yeah, a quorum. we would be immediate. So um, there are five individuals on the citizen complaint subcommittee, and there are seven on the state and local policies, and I would have to figure out where there's overlap, but there's not a ton of overlap. So in any case, some people get booted off. 
as well. It's yeah, I, I suggest that we maintain our groups both because we need the help in the drafting and, and I think with regard to these two specific committees, I think it made sense for the survey instrument to fuse them and Shannon, you've done that. Thank you. And it, but I think when we get to to looking at what comes back in, I think that it's, it's worth keeping them separate anyways. Yeah, I will say from the body of work, I think each committee has more than enough of a body of work separately. It would be a lot together, but obviously it's up to you. And so um, in, in working on some of these drafts too, I would like to kind of reiterate what Kelly said earlier. What, we, what we'll be doing, I think, is, you know, and this is something that um, Tim had said in the past with regarding to the regs, like let us be your wordsmithers you know, we are, we will help you, the concepts and, and big picture ideas and certain pieces, um, but we will help with, with like kind of putting it all together for you, working with, I think, um, and you guys, I think, could vote on this today as well, but not just working with the co-chairs of each individual subcommittee, we can, I think we can also get our board co-chairs um, involved too once the subcommittees kind of make certain recommendations. I'm wondering, you know, given the limitations of how the committees can be working together, whether it makes sense today to um, reach some agreements as to what are some components that we think should be in each of the chapters. You know, there was discussion earlier today about talking about deliverables going forward. You know, given that you know, this is our foundational report, which is really important, um, we have, we're going to have some information from the survey and looking at some other studies, but in the, in the near future, we'll be receiving more data and more information um, and what we plan on doing with that, ideas that we have about that for future reports, which to me um, could be very compelling. I think transparency is so key to these issues and to show the public and stakeholders you know what we plan to be doing with this information and maybe that's something an approach that should be in each chapter you know or maybe there's other components that we think that each chapter should address um, and if we were to agree upon that today maybe that would help for the consistency with the report and help the committees Okay. Um, so I thought that was what the community committees were going to do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I mean, yeah. we could try to come up with some. I mean, I, I discussed a, a number of foundational things. Others mm -hmm. did too. But um, you know, if we're going to create a rough draft by the November meeting, the the subcommittee needs to to drill down on exactly what's going to happen. I mean, we could try to do that. At least key themes. But uh, you know, getting down too much in the weeds, I think it would be hard for us to do here. Are there certain components that the board together we feel like would be very important to address in each of the areas? Yeah, I guess another way of thinking about that question is maybe like, is there anything that you want to make certain is included in this first report? Whether that's thematically or concrete, you know, deliverables or whatever else, like if we produce this thing we get down to the final end and you're like you know final version and you're sitting there going well wait why didn't we talk about what are those things maybe those are some things to highlight or at least to contemplate now well i mean uh, the, the things that are that are, we've talked about i mean have to be considered as as necessary for the, if any of the future reports are going to contain data and we don't have the foundational information in there i think it's going to be difficult so you know in in uh in the, the minutes of the evidence-based uh, notes, there's a discussion about the 2018 report, and I mean, pretty much all of those included, obviously, some of the contextual information, the historical information, mm -hmm. need to be included at a minimum. I think we all have a, a sort of agreed to that. Um, Um, the committees have outlined the essentials in each of the subject, the bucket areas, in terms of making this report uh, readable to the public because it'll be lots of different voices. What I hear you saying is that you'll, you'll be the editors. You'll help it read with one voice and uh, wordsmith it. 
but I think structurally, maybe what would be helpful is to for all of us to consider what is the uh, the baseline or the contextual information for each of these different components, and um, you know what we expect to be coming in and in terms of data or information in the coming years that we would then be looking to incorporate. You know, so a look, f a, um, you know, how we got here, where we're at, and a look forward could be just like some three general uh, buckets that we're all keeping in mind when we're writing the report. Will this information be available to the board prior to the next meeting, or does this fall within the public realm where the public must see it at the same time that we do? All of your communications are going to be public records. With the entire board. So if you're yes. going to create it. Everything. Everything is. It, we can definitely share. We will, we will be sharing everything with the entire board. Um, Prior to the next meeting? You, yes. You mean the, the, the whatever the subcommittee Whatever you guys with, draft we, up. Yes. Whatever you guys draft up, the law, the ability to review it prior to a meeting. Correct. Okay. But I, I just wanted to also kind of add that as you are communicating with our office, drafts are considered public records. Sure. What, what about the concept of taking all of the minutes, if you will, that were approved today and the minutes from the previous three RIPA meetings to incorporate those is the document of moving forward rather than, uh, as, as maybe Andrea pointed out, I, I don't think we're going to be here all day if we try and decide that, uh, but taking the minutes from the three or four <coughs> RIPA meetings that we've had, that in conjunction with some of the subcommittee meetings to create a document bringing that to the co-chairs for their perusal prior to it going to the entire board and then as that's wordsmith then bring that document to the entire board for our review to only discuss at the next open meeting but for us to see it prior to not for us to comment in between but I think you guys have the ability to talk directly with the co-chairs without other people just a thought of trying to streamline it to cover all the topics that have been discussed over the last year. I think uh, a more streamlined approach would be to have the co-chairs do the drafting, share in the public meetings with their committees, and then, um, you know, thinking about those three buckets of where, we, where we've been, where we are, and where we're headed, uh, and, and synthesize whatever we've been talking about in these meetings, and then, um, look to you all as editors and look to our illustrious chairs for the preamble and and a conclusion would be nice so so in, in the essence of time i, I want to put forth a motion that uh both myself and the other co-chair will work in partnership with the doj to come up with an initial draft including the preamble um, uh, to have that presented to the board members before our next uh board meeting um, for review and, and, and ultimately uh, ratification. Mm -hmm. um, just to the point, I, I, I don't think that the, the um, history and the importance of how we got here, I, I don't, wouldn't see as a preamble. I think that's its own section, mm -hmm. which is, you know, and I, I do think this is, we're coming up with basically an outline that can provide a structure for the overall report as well as for each of the individual committee reports and what I've heard is sort of where we were and how we got here what's the state of the issue today where are the gaps in whether it's data or knowledge or evidence etc and and I guess I would encourage that both for the overall report and the and certainly for the subcommittee reports that the deliverables focus on 2018 because um, I think we're just getting started and I, who knows where we'll be uh, before each of our four-year term expires. Um, the overall piece the co-chairs do might be great to convey a sense to the public of, you know, how we have defined what's within and what isn't within the scope of the overall work of the committee. Um, but I think those four sections uh, would provide a structure for the report as well as for the, um, for the individual committee.
committee reports and and then figuring out how to integrate in a meaningful way the public comment that we've received. Do we have a second with uh, the aforementioned amendments? Uh, all in favor, uh, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. We've got a process as to how we'll move forward with uh, coming up with a draft uh, for the report before the next meeting. Thank you, everyone, for that. I know there was a couple more motions that I think we probably needed to touch on before um, let me transition, so let me toss that over to uh, Madrano to talk about the survey. Yes, there's been a, a, a motion discussed about uh, releasing a set of surveys. Not, these are not the final surveys, but in, in theory, these are the, the, the contextual design of the theory to be sent out to law enforcement agencies to solicit feedback so that we can include some of that information in our 20, 2018 report. So the motion would be to authorize uh, uh, DOJ to work with uh, the committee chairs to, to release those um, surveys. So the surveys as they are, or just the idea of releasing surveys that we will have an opportunity to revise and edit? Um, the, uh, these are not the final surveys. They will be, they will be revised uh, with input from the committee chairs. What if you want to provide input and you're not one of the committee chairs? Mm -hmm. then this would be an opportunity to do that as well. Well, we haven't had an opportunity to actually look at a survey, but I would like to look at it and uh, contribute something. You, you can it's provide that to right? You're just talking about the survey specifically that would ask about the citizen complaint policies and procedures and the um, racial identity profiling policies okay. and procedures, right? She, she's a committee chair, so she could coordinate. Right, but on a different subcommittee, but that's okay. I, you can send me things one directionally, I can incorporate things, and then um, just, I will, it just will be one way. I will incorporate any feedback you have. Okay. okay. Both committees and that, that discuss having a survey and fully support that. Given the turnaround, I don't think it's realistic to think that we're gonna finalize the survey instrument, send it out to the field, get back responses, meaningfully analyze those responses, mm -hmm. and incorporate them in a document that has to be finalized in basically 10 weeks. Um, so if we can get it out before the end of the year, I think that would be realistic. Uh, but I think we could take the time that is needed for the other committees that didn't even necessarily think about or talk about a survey instrument to meaningfully. So, Because I also think you know, we'll be immediately, we're already, I'm sure, uh, a pain in the butt for law enforcement just in terms of the data that they're thinking about having. And if we start sending out multiple surveys and requests for information uh, each year, I think uh, mm -hmm. people may go crazy. So. I respectfully, <laughs> I respectfully disagree. Okay. I think um, we need to honor the commitment we've made to the, com to the community to get some baseline information. This is not the deep dive on the policies. This is, do you have a policy and what is it? The survey instrument that I think Shannon has put together is, um, is a good one. I think, you know, certainly if anyone has any additions to it, uh, they should chime in or send her a one, one directional email. But uh, it, is, it is something that could go out. She's prepared to, to put it out um, by Monday, as I understand it, <laughs> and possibly tomorrow, uh, if there are no comments on it, and to get a quick turnaround on it. If we got it back on the date that she specified here in the instrument, which is October 6th, then you know, um, I think we could do the, the we could provide the, the, the baseline information about who has policies and who doesn't. This is not the deep dive into those policies. That's another year out. But I think that, that provides the kind of baseline information and in, in, in initial engagement with all of the law enforcement agencies that we've just talked about that's so important. Was there a discussion about just targeting the, the largest agencies first, or was that, did I miss that? We, we had a discussion about, it started out, uh, I'll speak for our subcommittee. We start out with the uh, the eight or nine um, agencies that are going the first group starting uh, July 1, 2018, and then we had a discussion about uh, the uh, DOJ zones, maybe getting some of those 
small, medium, and large agencies uh, from those zones and include them too. That's how it started out, and then we finally ended up, hey, let's just survey the whole, whole state, all the law enforcement agencies in the state for, for our working group. Right, obviously realizing we wouldn't get 100% participation. Um, I'll just piggyback what Andrea said. I don't, I don't think it's a big deal to send it out as long as all the committee members aren't sending Shannon one-way emails saying, well, I want this and I want this and I want this, because then we absolutely go right into what Tim was talking about. So. Yeah, but then we'll be able to discuss that with the individual yeah. we'll figure it out. I, 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 don't, I don't really think that given the time frame that we have and the it's just really a limited focus that the co-chairs will probably not want to expand this much more, but we certainly want to hear your, your thoughts. My, my comment, uh, I, I know uh, in reading it, and it was mentioned about if we send it out, maybe go out Friday or maybe Monday and having the responses back by the 6th, well, the 6th is next, next Friday. And that, that's a pretty short turnaround. And that is also probably going to be something that would need to be Discussed. I agree. So, with, with with everyone that's feeling very passionate in a variety of different ways, does someone want to put forth a motion? <laughs> I think I'll just restate my my motion to go ahead and authorize the, the committee chairs to work uh, with DOJ to get out uh, those surveys. And uh, if board members uh, want to provide one-way communication to Shannon relative to uh, comments on the surveys, they can so do so. They can do so. By Friday? By Friday. <laughs> do we have a second? Second. second. All in favor, maybe, because this, I know there's different opinions, so maybe all in favor, raise your hand. All right. I think the motion it's unanimous it's unanimous it's so <laughs> carries all right um i have one item yeah uh can we talk a little bit about the next set of subcommittee meetings and on what time frame you would like to hold these i think you've probably been able to tell scheduling subcommittee meetings is a really enormous nightmare um and we you know that you guys are so dedicated to your to your job <laughs> and you're really busy people. I recognize that this is you all have full-time jobs that are separate and completely separate from this um, but yeah so I think just you know thinking through then the timeline of this knowing that we will have a meeting on November 27th of, as the full board and December 19th by video conference as a full board um, we are looking to at least notice the next subcommittee meetings next round, probably sometime next week. And those need to be noticed 10 days in advance. So we're looking at either like the second, third, fourth weeks of October. But it's also sort of up to you to decide, well, how quickly do you, do you want to convene for these surveys? Depending on the timeline, we may not have results back till the second week, or the end of second week of October, perhaps, something like that. Um, so in any case, just throwing out to think about. And, and I just, um, kind of thinking out loud, we had talked about, because there's some scheduling issues with, um, we had talked about maybe just doing one subcommittee meeting in between now and the 27th. But if you think that you really would like to have two full subcommittee meetings between that time, because it really is almost two full months. Yeah, I think one, one is good. And I think okay. give us give the co-chairs time to draft so that when the meeting is called, we have something to share and to crunch through with our committees. I'm thinking the week of October 23rd for the next set. So let's think. Well, but yeah, so that would give us about a month to draft. All right. I see a lot of people nodding here, so I guess we'll wait to... I, I'm sorry. I'm hijacking your meeting, but I just no wanted problem. to make one Hijack more announcement. Uh, we have <coughs> official word that the governor did sign AB 1518 today. So the statute has been amended. All right. All right. Well, unless... Uh, well, maybe we'll open up this space to see if there are any final comments and or issues that want to be raised by... Uh, any of the board members? 
What, I'm sorry. I just had another question yeah. about the, the questionnaire. So you're anticip how, how long are you thinking it'll take to actually um, look at the data and prepare, you know, some summary of the results of the survey that will go out to the agencies? Asking about how long it would take us to review the policies that are provided as a part of the survey? Yeah, I'm, I'm asking how long it'll take you to um, look at the survey responses and prepare some kind of summary of the responses. So I think we I think we'll have to go back to the the subcommittees about that. I think part of it was a, as a consideration that this would be collected uh, now and be analyzed in a deeper dive for next report. But I think we would leave that to the co-chairs or the subcommittees to to further contemplate. Yeah, and one of the things we talked about was some of the basic questions. Do you have a policy? You know, the yes no ones are going to be super simple, and I right. think we could have a, a report initially on that but to actually look at the policies and develop some samples and, and things like that yeah so and that's what i, I think the yes no i think ones. i think the ones yeah the yes no ones are, are great but i think it'll take a lot of effort to Correct. a lot of the questions are open-ended and that's not simple it, it's going to take a long time yeah. actually to look at that and make sense of it and you know, you know so I, I don't think you should anticipate like having um like results on all of this, um, you know, even by January. Correct, so. and that was part of our discussion was at least referencing in the report though, this is what is being w looked at and worked on okay. based on this survey. So that way we could at least let people know that this is, this is, this is what we're doing with it, you know, so that way we can hopefully get it out as soon as possible. Okay. But it's gonna be right, it's gonna take time. And then one other, uh, question or uh, thing to comment on would be um, for the actual um, subcommittees. I don't know if we agreed on a structure for the reports for the subcommittees, and I think that could be pretty simple uh, for, you know, for the January report, which could be just um, sort of what the, you know, what the mandate is or what the goals are of the subcommittee, what the deliverables are, and then some timeline for when um, you think those deliverables will happen. And that could be the case across all five subcommittees. It'll have the same format, and I think um, that's a, a easy one. For next year and all of ours, why don't you set up monthly standing meetings so the subcommittees? We're going to have a lot of work. If the chairs decide on a certain month they want to cancel the meeting, they can. But you know, it's the first Wednesday of every month from this time to this time, and then you don't have to scramble every time to try to schedule the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and sorry, can I say one more thing? Is uh, <laughs> so a, a number of people spoke about just like kind of using what we have that um, is kind of available, and you don't need to reinvent the wheel for everything. And um, there is, uh, as part of the um, post training, the principal policing training, you know, th there is a whole module that's just about the history of policing in the U.S. Um, and, you know, that's, instead of, like, writing up this whole new thing, I mean, it's already uh, a part of a training that's being given. It's just for law enforcement, but uh, we could talk uh, to um, the captain, um, Scott uh, Metters, at, in Stockton is the person who um, developed this whole module on the history. We could maybe you know, sort of talk to him about uh, the, the possibility of releasing that for the public. Um, I think that would also help the public to, you know, see that law enforcement actually is, you know, that they're sort of interested in um, looking at these issues and looking at uh, their own profession and the history of that profession and how that could be still affecting um, police community relations today. Uh, and, and knowing that they actually get that training, I think would be, um, you know that that would be good for the public, and and it would be good for <laughs> for the board. I think to um, already have you know something that is you know is out there and um, pe you know that the law enforcement is receiving, and that we don't have to reinvent the wheel around. Yeah, no, I think we we certainly can can uh, use that as, as certainly a resource. I think there's a couple uh, versions of that module four that both exist at the DOJ level, cer certainly Oakland PD's 
uh, module, the one that all of us work together and use with the principal policing and the initial uh, rollout of that. So noted, we'll, we'll yeah. pull those and see if maybe that can be a starting point. I had a quick question regarding the December 19th date. Is that edged in stone? I know, it's, I, know I have travel plans during that week. I was wondering if the week before, the week of the December 11th, is, is a possible time? Because the closer you get to the holidays, other folks may have travel plans. There wouldn't, I don't think there'll be enough time to do drafting and get you a draft before, if we did the meeting the week earlier. And um, if you are traveling the state of California, perhaps you can know, participate yeah. in a video. Um, oh, best state travel. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we understand that not every member will be able to attend and it's a terrible time, but um, we'll keep you in the loop as, as we can. Where is that? It'll be by video conference. So we'll have, we haven't decided what cities yet, but um, a lot of cities. But we'll have more than one city, so that it'll be geographically easier for folks. We're working on that. We have a little time to get that one noticed. A question to DOJ. Uh, Chief Madrano brought it up earlier. Are we limited by the statute? on who can and cannot be a part of this RIPA board? Are we able to expand it? We are limited by statute. Thank you. There is a vacancy currently. Um, the, the president pro tem has not filled Kelly Evans' position. Could we perhaps recommend to him that he consider a post representative as a lot of this is going to be based off of law enforcement training? You're, you are free to, rep, to recommend whomever you choose. Um, that would be my request to the chairs. We've just been asking uh, for an appointee. <laughs> that would be my recommendation to the chairs. So I think with, with the diversity of, of uh, different perspectives, if folks want to make recommendations about appointees to fill uh, uh, the, the distinguished uh, Kelly Edmonds seat. Uh, maybe we can put those, we can send those uh, recommendations to the DOJ. Well, it's actually the Senate pro tems. Oh, the Senate pro tems. Okay. Well, I think that's all that we got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's Kevin. Yes, Judge. Someone was sending a recommendation to fill a vacant position. Yes, sir. Well, if we're going to do that, then I'd like to send them a recommendation, too. Um, I think that the position should be filled by a person who, to the extent possible, represents the constituency that the previous person represented. So if one's going to go, I'd, I'd like that one to go, too. So to be clear, uh, so the pro tem, I've been having some conversations with their appointments office for a couple of months. They've been interviewing and considering different folks. Um, I'm obviously more just interested in, I have a vacancy, I've had it for a few months, would you fill it? But from your perspective, um, you individually sh should certainly feel free to submit a recommendation to the Senate Pro Tem's office, um, to, you know, to throw somebody's hat in the ring. I don't know, it's obviously up to the board, but I don't know if the board feels that they want to make a recommendation as a full board. Well, but you can well, do it on your own. Well, is that what's being done with yours then? <laughs> yeah. No, I think the chairman acknowledged. My because a lot depend. You know, it's it's important when the recommendation goes in that uh, the entity to whom the recommendation goes knows what constituency is being represented by that recommendation. So I'd like to suggest that individuals make whatever comments they want to the president pro tem. Okay. And that. I mean, this board, it's going to take a long time to eliminate racial identity profiling, and maybe none of us will be on it at that time, but um, there may come a time where we may want to suggest changes to the composition of the board to add someone from post, add someone with particular expertise as the work evolves. But I would say for now, when it's down to individual vacancies, just leave it to individuals or organizations that are represented here, or the community, to weigh in with the uh, President Pro Tem and uh, recommend anyone they want. 
All right, so just to echo that as a process point, uh, for, for any of us that would want to uh, make a recommendation, we can do that directly to the Senate Pro Tem. We'll leave any excess action items and points and meetings from this board uh, from that, as I think our hands are very full. All right, we've got about five minutes left. Any other issues that want to be raised uh, by any board members or final questions, concerns before we prepare to adjourn? Subcommittee, which I'm not on, I didn't see their minutes. Um, but in light of the, the comments by Judge Lytle and, and the written comments that she submitted, and in light of what we saw as a group presented, I, I got to say that uh, the post video is woefully inadequate in in regard to, at least in my opinion, um, racial bias training and. And so is there or was there a recommendation in the post subcommittee to change the, the video that's being shown and can we make a recommendation as a board that it should be changed and, and be more encompassing of the comments by Judge Lytle and, and, and basically beef it up um, so that it, it really does understand what's happened in this country for a couple hundred years and how we got to be where we are. So, so my understanding, and, and I, you know, I can be corrected if I'm wrong, my understanding was that that video was not necessarily created specifically for this body and entity or this scope of work, but that was a tool that Post has created that they're using. Right, no, that's what I mean. Okay. Is that, so, so can we as a body recommend that they do something different? And, and shouldn't we? I, I, I believe the, the quick answer is probably yes. I think we can make recommendations to post. I think it's something we can bring up as a part of our conversation in the subcommittee. Um, I, I the board is they're planning additional videos, and so. Additional videos? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the board is empowered to make uh, broad based recommendations regarding training that you think would be helpful for addressing this issue. Um, it may have to do with the video, it may have to do with many, many other things. So, but this is one of the topics that the board is authorized and, and empowered and expected to do is to make uh, training recommendations and work with POST to have the best training possible. So in the interest of doing something rather than waiting on data, I think we should look at doing something recommending that POST change um, the kind of training, the racial bias training that they currently use now in our report, in our report that's coming up. Um, I mean, I, I, I've attended and um, been part of the distribution of racial bias training in um, my office and neighboring offices that encompass over 100 lawyers. Um, we were trained by a, a law professor in the state of Washington. I think he's in the state of Washington, but associated with the ACLU. Um, Jeffrey Robinson, um, and, and really speaks to, in that training, um, a number of the issues that Judge Lytle had, had brought up and, and deals with the current state of the mindset of what's happening on the street in this country and how it got to be where it is, and, and I thought was incredibly effective uh, uh, as a training tool. And, and so I would ask the post subcommittee to look at that or other options as far as making recommendations now for um, for racial bias training for police officers throughout the state. And and as somebody who's on the subcommittee, and I see Ralph still in the back of the room, um, my understanding is that they're currently going through the practice of taking a look at all that training again because it's been a few years and that they also made it very clear that they want input from anyone on that training and that they will absolutely take input to that. You just have to get a hold of um, Post and let them know that they are very interested in having others involved in establishing what the new guidelines are as they come out. And so for the things that you said, I think that that was what was reiterated to us by Post in that committee is they are actively looking at that and anyone who's interested in having input on that get a hold of posts and they'd be glad to take
take that input and, and hopefully develop some, some better training. I took that video as one piece of the puzzle for, <coughs> of the broad range of things that POST is working on. Yeah, so I'll just add a little bit too because I've been having several conversations with POST. Um, so they are creating a whole new racial and identity profiling training um, and are interested in having the POST subcommittee consult with them on the creation of that training. Um, I think that, so actually, thank you for bringing this up because if you are on the post subcommittee, come speak with me before you go home because I have training um, videos if you're interested in some of them um, for members of that committee and also for others if they want to see them. Um, but in any case, the, the process, so uh, Reverend McBride spoke to earlier, the discussion about bringing on a content expert to, to help with this analysis, and that would be to consult on their existing training. The refresher course, the like in-service training, is called Bias-Based Policing, Remaining Fair and Impartial. Um, I, they're actually in your packets are um, the facilitation guide for that and the student work guide for that, and that is, goes along with the video, of which I've sent at least all the post subcommittee members a copy of that training. So these are things that we can, that committee will begin to analyze if we bring on a subject expert to help along with that analysis, do that too, and then that'll inform what new training is generated. I just want to go back to two points that were made. To Mike's point earlier, <clears throat> regardless of who gets appointed uh, for the vacancy, it, I don't think there's anything in the law that precludes the uh, Reverend McBride and, and Mr. Ali from uh, structuring that subcommittee in such a way that they have regular engagement at whatever frequency they think is right, whether it's every meeting or, or other meetings, and engage a uh, post in that conversation that goes deep. Um, and then what I heard you, you saying, which I think it, it is important in looking at the, um, as we hurdle towards an overall report, is that in any of these areas, if, um, if there are recommendations that are ready to go, near-term recommendations, whether it be about filling data gaps or whatnot, that I agree with you, we don't need to hold back if, uh, if subcommittees and if the board takes a vote and says, yeah, we've, we've got some early recommendations after a year of work yeah. about post or anything else. All right, recommendations noted. Uh, we do want to thank the public for uh, being here. We know, you know, from giving up four and a half hours of your time uh, is a significant contribution uh, to us trying to build a, a more safer uh, California for us all. So we want to appreciate all the public for being here. Certainly appreciate all the board members for taking time out of uh, your busy schedules to make it up here to Oakland. Uh, as a resident here, I'm, I didn't welcome you all to uh, my city, but we'll wish you well in your departure uh, <laughs> from our city. Uh, so thank you, everyone. I think uh, thank the co-chair uh, for his support. I think we can consider our meeting adjourned. <laughs>